There is a uh, question that I've always wondered about, and I've used this question in the past many, many years ago, and it's one that was a little jingle that, that was sung a long time ago. It says, does your chewing gum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? That has pondered me quite a long time. How in the world can my chewing gum not lose its flavor? Of course, I don't worry about chewing gum. I don't stick it on the bedpost. At least Mary hasn't found it yet. And <coughs> yeah, but we, we do have a situation on our hands that we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, many times we start our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ with a kaboom. It is an amazing thing to know that there is a God and that he loves us individually and our sins are forgiven. And when we see that happen, boom, there is a God who loves me. And there can be a euphoria that follows from that and great enthusiasm for the kingdom of God. And I've told you this before also, is that when I went and got involved with the church, I knew that God wanted me involved with the church, I found a church, and I was sitting there amongst all these saints, and some of these saints that were there had been there for 35 years, and I just had been a Christian for maybe two years. And God had done so many things in my life to transform me. I was a different person than I was two years before. Amazing things. And I look at those individuals of 35 years, and I say, if God has done what he did in my life for two years, in their lives for 35 years, they must be excited about Jesus and excited about their walk with God. But I didn't see that in their lives. Somewhere along the line, the flavor had lost, had left their lives. Somewhere along the line, they, they lost it. They were coming to church, yes, they were sitting there listening to the pastor just like I was sitting listening to the pastor. But they lost that great enthusiasm in their life. Let me tell you, the same God that called you at the very beginning of your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ is the very same God who is alive today and well. He is the same God and he does, does the same thing. He works all things after the counsel of his will. He has not gone and started playing tiddlywinks. He's not gone off to the side and said, well, I'll wait until something exciting happens and I'll show up in your life. He is here. Paul says this very clearly. He says, in him we move and breathe and have our being. And he has given us an invitation. And this invitation is a lifelong invitation. He says this, Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, and all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The invitation is to come and have fellowship with me. Come to me, and I will give you this rest. It isn't come to me and get worn out doing church. It didn't say that. Come to me, and I'll, I'll put you to work. Get, come to me and I'll put you on a shelf. He didn't do any of that. He says, come to me, I'll give you rest. The invitation is amazing. In the Old Testament, he gives us the invitation as well. And, and we find in Jeremiah 31, 33 this, he says this, but this is the covenant which I'll make with the house of Israel after those days. This is the covenant that comes to us. This is called the new covenant. Declares the Lord, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. I shall be their God. It is an affirmation that he is going to be alongside of us and we are going to be alongside of him. We are going to have fellowship with the Father. At the same time that God gives us great invitation to come, and we're all excited about being able to come to the Father as long as he doesn't show up in person. You ever think about that? As long as he doesn't show up in person. What happens if he shows up in person? But whom to are invited? Isaiah had an event with God where he shows up in person. He says, and the foundations, oh, I'm sorry. I saw the Lord. <clears throat> I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with a train of his robe filling the temple. 
Again, holy, 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 as the angels were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold tremble at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. This is in Isaiah 6. He, he sees the glory of God and he is undone. He says this, he says this, Woe to me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For thy eyes, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. To whom are we invited? We're not invited. What a friend we have in Jesus. Yes, we have a great friend, but he is still God. John the apostle whom loved the Lord and the Lord loved him, who laid his head on his shoulder. When God shows up to him at the Isle of Patmos in the form of an angel, probably a watered-down version of what he really looks like, John, the apostle, falls down as though he is dead. And so God is telling us, come to me, you are weary and heavenly, I will give you rest. And we're all excited about that as long as he doesn't show up in person because he is God. He is holy and he is awesome in his wonders. But his invitation is still there. This God who cannot help himself of being holy and righteous because that is who he is, is reaching out to us who are not so holy and not so righteous, and he says, I, who am God, want to have you near me. I want you near me. He says to us, even though I am who I am, I invite you to draw near. In James 4, 8 says this, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. This is what, get ready for God. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Sure, most of us have not had Isaiah's experience, nor John's experience. And I think our knees would be knocking if we did. But he still wants to be near us and wants us to be near him. He says in Isaiah 4, 4, 6, uh, Hebrews 4.16, it says this, Therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Got that? Draw near with confidence. Now how in the world can a well-nigh insatiable worldling like myself have the confidence to draw near to God? How could it do it? How could it be done? He says, draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the question that we have. How is it that I can keep the light of power and the strength that I received when I received Jesus as my Savior and Lord all the days of my life? And how can I be able to get into his presence to receive that help I need in life with confidence that God is going to hear me and draw me close to himself as I draw near to him. And so John, we're going to go back to 1 John again, and says John is going to give us some powerful information for us to help us along the way. He says this, don't forget about the light. After he says that our fellowship was with the Father and with the Son, he says, this is the message which we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. That is a good news. God is always good and will always remain good. God is always holy and will always remain holy. You can count on who he is. And he is full of light. He is full of light. So, how is it that we who sometimes are not in that be able to come into his presence because God tells us that that which is impure cannot stand before him, they would die in his presence. 
and yet God has invited us to his presence. And so John is going to tell us, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, so therefore what must we be? We must be in the light with no darkness at all. So he says, <clears throat> for us to do that. But we are not coming to God who is in his fullness and power and strength. Notice what it says. Approaching this fellowship, how do you get to that fellowship? For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched in a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a whirlwind and to the blast of the trumpet and the sound of words which sound as such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command, if even a beast touched the mountain, it would be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. He says, I'm not bringing, when God says for us to come, we're not going to God in the Old Testament methodology of things. We're not going to the place where he's on the mountain and we're told not to even come near the mountain. But instead, this one that is holy and mighty and wonderful is inviting us to come even closer to him than that which the Israelites were able to do. He goes on to say, but you have come, and this is still in Hebrews, but you have come to the Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all and to the spirit, spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and to, which, to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. This is what God tells us to do. Is He says, I am able to come and to you and say, draw near to me and I will draw near to you and we can come together in fellowship because Jesus is your mediator. He is the one who will find out in chapter 2 of John, 1 John that he has made God propitious toward us. That word propitious is extremely important for us to understand, is that there is animosity between God and man, but Jesus is the mediator, comes in between us and God, and he makes God favorable to us. That we are able to come not just to the mountain where God spoke to Moses, but we are able to come to the city of God, the living city of God, with all the, the, the saints and the angels and everybody else, with Jesus the mediator, we're able to come into that place which is even greater and more holy and more awesome because Jesus is our mediator. He is the one that makes it possible for us to come. How in the world can he do such a thing? Because he loves us with an everlasting love. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And this everlasting life is with the Father and with the Son. Amazing thing. So there's a simple conclusion to this whole thing about how can I do this. In 1 John 1.6 if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. He said in verse 5 that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. In verse 6 he says this thing that is an amazing thing. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So if we are going to be in the presence of God and in fellowship with him, then we must be in the light and have no darkness at all within us. Do you hear what he's... Um, John is an amazing book. A lot of individuals say, if you're a new Christian, you need to read 1 John. If you're a new Christian, this book should scare you spitless here. Because he is very plain. That to be in fellowship with God means that you are going to have to walk in the light and totally in the light and have no dealings with darkness. How in the world am I going to do it? This is the simple thing. He tells us that if 
I say that I have fellowship with the Father, and I have something against my brother, I am not walking in the light, but I am walking in darkness, and there is no truth in me. You do not practice the truth. It doesn't say that you do not practice the truth. If I say that I am going to walk, that I have fellowship with the Father, and I have hidden sin in my life, then I am in darkness and I do not practice the truth. If I say that I have fellowship with the Father and I am full of malice or jealousy or strife or self-opinionated, then I am not in the light. I am in darkness and I do not practice the truth. If I come and say that it is my will that needs to be done, then I am in darkness and I am not in the light and I'm not practicing the truth. Very simple that he tells us. But that's not my problem. See, whenever I was a Christian, a new Christian, I went to Dallas, the, Dallas for a, a seminar down there. Or a, it was called Explo 72. There was about 70,000 Christian young people down there. And I picked up a newspaper while I was down there. It was a Christian newspaper being handed out. And it had this cartoon that I'm going to show you here. And it says this, if you don't walk the walk, don't talk the talk. Okay, is this first, first John? Right there. If you don't walk the walk, don't talk the talk. It always has stuck with me. That what I've got is I've got to be consistent with what I believe that God is doing here. So what John tells us in verse 1-7, he tells us the secret of living the life from the beginning of our walk with the Lord to the end of our walk and being consistent in between. He tells us how we can walk in the light all the days of our life, of our life and be full of the power of God every single step of the way. He says this, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. But if we walk in the light, now understand that when you're walking the light, just like the, the little diagram I had of the guy standing under the light pole, and the light is shining on him. Stay in the light. You are not the light. What will wear people out in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ is if they think that they have to generate the light. If you think that you're the source of light, that you've got to be the light, then you're going to wear yourself out because you're not going to be successful there. You've got this body of yours that has been corrupted in this world. It has what we call a sin nature within it. It has a tendency toward sin. It is always, the flesh is opposed to the things of God. It cannot please God. It is constitutionally incapable of doing so. So if I try to make something that is dark light, I am wasting my time. It's not going to work. I'm going to get worn out. And I'm going to say, the Christian life doesn't work. I've tried Jesus. It doesn't work because I failed and I failed and I failed and I failed. And it can't be me that the problem is. It's got to be God that's the problem. So therefore, Christianity doesn't work. And so we go off to something else or we just go off in to oblivion as far as that is concerned. It just doesn't work. But that's not what God calls us to, is making this self-righteous. He's after us to walk in the light. That as I'm walking in this life of mine, I walk in the fullness and the presence of God every step of the way. That there is nothing hidden in my heart and is all exposed to God and I'm allowing God to do whatever he wants with that. That does not mean that I'm going to not sin, but it does mean that when I do sin, the light of Jesus shows me my sin and I'm able to do something about that and I can continue on walking with him. Uh, Martin Luther said an interesting thing. It's kind of a freaky thing that he said. He said, sin boldly, but believe in God more boldly still. He said, relax a little bit, guys. The just shall live by faith. 
the just shall live by faith. He's not advocating sinning boldly in the sense of that you can go out there and sin all you want to because God will forgive all your sins. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, is don't spend your time trying to clean up this old self. Whenever, whenever, whenever you walk along and you make a mess, the light shows the mess there and you just deal with it and you keep on walking with Jesus. The enemy wants to come along and say, look at you. Look at you. you. You're a lousy example of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. God hates you because you have done such evil things. And then Christians can do bad things. They can. But the secret of this life that we have is not that we become perfect in this life but that we become perfect when we see him and we are like him because we'll see him just as he is. That is the secret. I fully expect that you will find that your pastor is not perfect. And I fully expect that I'll find that you're not perfect either. Now you can try to hide it all you want to, but I know it's true. I know it. But one thing that we all have in common is we can walk in the light. And whenever one of us fail, it's not, I, I used to tell this to the guys that I worked with on the college campus, it's not so strange that I sin so much. But considering who I am, it's strange that I sin as little as I do. That's what's surprising. But it's because I've practiced certain things about walking in the light that make it so that I don't mess up so much. And that's what John's going to tell us, how, what we can do to make it so that we don't mess up so much. So he says this. He says, if we walk in the light, not that we are the light, Jesus is the light, we walk in his presence, and we walk along in this life, and I understand that my brothers and sisters in Christ can fail, and I understand that they need grace and mercy not only from God, but from myself as well, and I accept the fact that they may even fail in this such a way that I might even get hurt, and I walk in forgiveness of them because I have been forgiven by the God who created me and caused me to stand in this faith. And he is the one who made me stand in this faith. It is by his doing, it says, I can, well, in the passage, it is by his doing that we are in Christ Jesus. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is by his doing that we are this way. And it is not so amazing that we are perfect. It's amazing what happens is when we are imperfect that we are able to perfectly walk with Jesus. And so that's what we need to do is we need to do that. And so he says, if I walk in the light, I'm not the light, but I walk in the light, then I have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with one another. We can continue on down this road because I know that you're messing up and I'm messing up, but we're all walking in the light. And as, as you put that aside, I put my things aside, we're able to pick up and go and link our arms together and continue on walking down this road that we're going on. I'm not allowed to say, but you just don't know how hard it is. And you don't know how hard, what a terrible thing that person did to me. What a horrible thing that person did to me. No, the sin nature does it. That's what Paul says, that if I sin, then it's no longer I am the one that's doing it, but the sin that dwells within me. And so therefore, what I need to do is deal with the sin and get on down the road. And so we have fellowship with one another. We have that powerful ability to continue to walk in the light. If you do not forgive one another, then you are not walking in the light and the truth is not in you. You are not practicing the truth. That's all there is. So God says, forgive one another. So we forgive one another. God says, build up one another. So we build up one another. God says, accept one another. So we accept one another. Because that is walking in the light. And that's what a walking in the light is all about. That we accept one another. I may, to some of your opinion, I may have some idiosyncrasies. I'm not even sure what an idiosyncrasy is. But I understand that it means that I'm really weird. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm going to stay weird. 
Doesn't mean that at all. And it doesn't mean that I have to allow you to be idiosyncratic. I don't even know if that is a word. But it does mean that I have to accept you. You. That person you are. Who you are. And love you. Uh, Sherry talked about that God is excited whenever, our, well, their uncle was excited when he sees her. And I, I, I had to think of this congregation at that point in time is the way you greet one another on Sunday morning is an amazing thing. And I, you'll notice that I'm excited when I see you. And I am. I'm truly excited when I see you. I'm connected with you. It's, it's part of the whole thing, the acceptance of who you are. And to love you all the way into the kingdom of God and you to love me all the way into the kingdom of God is an amazing thing that God calls us into this fellowship. Then he says this, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. How many sins? How many? All except. No, all sin. Walking in the light. It's not that I'm the light. It's that I walk in the light. That everything that I am is exposed to God. Everything is open and bare before him. And I know that he, if I walk in this way, I may, I may not know what I'm doing sometimes. And I say, God, open up the eyes that maybe I'll see what I'm supposed to be doing with this whole thing. I don't know. But I'm in your light. You can show me. And if you convict me, I will respond. If you say, amen, I will respond. Whatever it is, oh God, I am in your light. I want to walk in that light. You see, the thing about it is, the light of God is self-generating and it is impossible for it to dull down. If I'm trying to live the Christian life, it is going to get dulled down really fast because I don't have that much energy. But God's light is always on. Better than Motel 6, right? It's always on. And we can do that. So key into this. We walk in the light of God. Not of ourselves. Not of the church. Not of what other put, people put on us or what we ought to do. We walk in the light of God. We are not that light. We only have to walk in the light. We only have to walk in the light. If all we do is done... If all we do, well, that was, if all we do is exposed to the light of God, then God cleanses us from all our sin. If everything that we do is exposed to God, then God cleanses us from our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Then and only then is true fellowship possible. Only then, when we, the body of Christ, is walking consistently in the walk that God gives to us in the light of God. Is true fellowship really possible? Really possible. So he says, don't you see the truth? If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Oh, I'm okay. It's not me that's doing that. I was, I, I was under the teaching of a fellow that was a great teacher. He was a, a, in fact, he was a Bible college professor. Not, not, he was the president of the Bible College. And he was a great teacher. He's a great communicator. But he was not walking in the light in a certain area. And he could only see that he was right. But everybody else could stand back and say, that's not right. But he was right. See? I was right. He was saying that I have no sin. And as such... He was deceiving himself and he was hurting people as he went. And he was hurting the body of Christ. We've got to understand that we have the ability to sin. That I'm, I, I'm a sinner because I sin, true. But also, I sin because I'm a sinner. It works both ways. And I cannot deny the fact. There is a theology out there of a, of a certain church that says that there's a second blessing that God gives, and after you, God gives you that second blessing, you are totally sinless. 
clothing centers. And so my, my pastor friend up in Montana, he was playing tennis with one of these perfectly sinless people, and the, the game was not going so well for the, the fellow that was playing him, and he started cussing. And so my pastor's friend said, he said, uh, what happened to your sinlessness? And the guy said, well, I guess I must not have had the second blessing. He wouldn't change his theology to the truth of the fact that he has sin. Let us be real about this. We have sin in our lives. But if I'm walking in the light, what happens to it? It's cleansed, right? That's what the verse said. He cleanses us from all sin. So how do we do that? We come to the power verse, and I do this power verse all the time, and you're probably very familiar with it because they tell you to write it across the back of your forehead, write it, scribble it in your skull. This verse is an amazing verse because what it does is enables you to know that your sin has been dealt with and you don't have to pick it up and play with it again. All right? If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us, so we want to be set free to soar as a fellow saints of God. So therefore, this verse here in 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this verse because I've done it over and over and over again. But understand what it says. If we agree with God, confess with God is just basically saying, God, this is a mess I have made. I agree that that's a mess. That's all God is asking for. He's already paid for the sin, yes. The blood of Jesus has covered all sin, past, present, and future. The blood has dealt with our sin. But we are recognizing, God, this is a mess that I have made here. He says, if you agree with God that this is a mess, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which means that as I'm walking in the light and I recognize a mistake that I have made and I have allowed sin to come into my life, anger come into my life, hurt, whatever it is that have come into life, lust, whatever it is, I've allowed it to come into my life. I say, God, I agree with you that that is a mess. That is sin. And he says, it is under the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It is clean. Okay. Not only that, he says, that that is clean. He says, if we confess that which we know about as being wrong, that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. You notice how the word says in there? He forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, which means that as I'm going along, I may do, come along and God cleanses me even from the things I don't even know that I've done wrong. And I'm able to walk in the light and I'm able to walk in fellowship with my Father and, my, and the Son and, and the Holy Spirit and with you all because he cleanses me from that. He cleanses you from that. And we can go down the road assuming that all things are good. All things are dealt with. All things are done with. And I'm able to walk in the power of God. It is an amazing thing. And then he says, are you still hard-headed? <laughs> Don't you hear what I'm saying? He says, if we say, in verse 10, last 10 verse, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Come on, guys. I told you you sinned. Don't say that you're not a sinner. If you say that you haven't sinned, you make him a liar because he says you have. I am a redeemed reject from the dung heap of humanity. I am no longer there in the deep. I'm no longer rejected. I have been accepted by God because he called me out of darkness and into the light of his dear son. That's what you happens to you. And that's who you are. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, then this walk in the light of God is available to each and every one of us who have been called out of darkness and into the light of his dear son. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's have a fellowship that totally and completely is awesome. 
one of acceptance of one another, one of believing in each other. I was at a church, I've told you this story also, that's the trouble with being a pastor for a long time in a certain location is you tell the stories over and over again. But I was in the church, and they were having troubles in that church, and I stood up as a dumb youth minister and told the guys in the board, I said, guys, you need to forgive one another because there had been, they, you could tell there was, they were holding on grudges from past years. If you don't forgive each other, we're going to continue on this cycle of growing, fail, fail, grow, fail, grow, fail, grow, fail. And they said, by their actions, not by verbal, but they, by their actions, they said, no, we're going to hold on to our grudges. And that church has continued to go up and down, up and up and up. It had the potential of being a powerful church. But they chose to hold on to their grudges with each other. Let us have a fellowship that is one that recognizing you're a sinner, I'm a sinner too. But your sin has been dealt with and my sin has been dealt with too. Let's go down the road together. And if I see you, my brother or sister, falling into the mud, I'm going to help you out of the mud. I'm not going to talk about it to somebody else. Look, see all the mud on them? That's called gossip, isn't it? Yeah. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to help the person out of the mud. Because I may be in the mud the next moment, and I need help. I need a lot of help. Yeah. I need a lot of help. I don't do humanity very well. I don't, I'm not very good human. But I get by with the help of my friends. Yeah? A little help of my friends. I can get by. This is the God that calls us to himself. He says, I want to have fellowship with you. I, the awesome, holy God that I am. I'll water myself down a little bit so that your knees are not knocking all the time. But I'm going to have fellowship with you. And you, my children, are going to have fellowship with me. It's going to be good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for your word that is so powerful and so rich that you called us into this fellowship. We pray, Father, that as we learn from John the rest of the stories that he tells us and the rest of the messages that he gives to us, that it transforms our hearts and minds now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to follow you with all of our heart and soul. Bless this day. And Father, here we are preaching about this verse again. But here we give the opportunity. If there's something in the heart of your people here that needs to be confessed, needs to be brought forth into the light, this is their opportunity to do so, is to bring it into your light. In their own heart, they don't have to confess to others around them. They need to confess to you and you alone, for you alone have they sinned against. And so they bring it before you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God, I bring this and I expose it to the light. God, I agree that it is wrong. Thank you for forgiving my sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, which has covered that, and I am clean now. Let me walk with you, O oh God, and let me continue on in the light. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are the people of God, and who is Lord? Jesus. Go walk in the light.